know we gotta peep this damn documentary. Greatest lie ever sold. Candace Owens calling out BLM. Um, I'm gonna do this shit in parts because it's like an hour and some change, man. So we're gonna do it like I did. Uh, what is a woman with Matt Walsh? I don't know how many parts to be in, but let's get it going. Candace Owens, the greatest lie ever sold. Let's get it. <clears throat> Facts. 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 Step out and face I'm away. Sorry. Please don't shoot me, Mr. Officer. Please. Don't shoot me, man. Step Please. out and face away. Can you not shoot me, man? I'm not shooting you. Step out and okay, face away. Okay, okay, okay. Please. Please, please, man. Please, please. I didn't know, man. Get out of the car. I didn't know, Mr. Officer. I didn't know. Get into the car. Hey, you come back. Stay in the car. Stop resisting that. Yes, you are. Well, you got it down, man. Let him breathe, least, man. Let him breathe. I've been trying to hear about you. Yeah, I'm trying to breathe with you. 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 I have decided to do this video. It has been weighing very heavily on my heart. I um, want to come out and say uh, that I do not support George Floyd and the media depiction of him as a martyr for black America. I'm going to explain why and I hope that some of you guys will understand where I'm coming from. I want to be clear, this is not a defense for Derek Chauvin. I hope Derek Chauvin gets the justice that, um, that he deserves to be um, you know, implemented upon him and that the family um, of George Floyd deserves justice. Okay, interview side, take so two. It was just gut instinct, you know? It just felt like we were being told, look over here, look over here. And I guess part of my personality is when I feel that way and somebody's going, focus only here, only here, only here, I wanna know, okay, but what about over there? And it wasn't personal, at least not in the beginning, it wasn't personal. I would say it certainly wasn't personal until. Uh, this video was just, it was just so disgusting, but I think it's important to understand how easily people can be corrupted into saying this type of disgusting nonsense. Candace Owen, that rotten bitch. If anybody's going to pretend to get their feelings hurt about it, what we say about Candace Owens, I will laugh and laugh and laugh. I don't care what this did. I don't care if it personally kick Candace Owens and her stinky pussy. I don't know if it stinks, but I imagine it does. Then at that moment, it became personal. And I thought, not only am I going to say the truth, <laughs> I am going to scream the truth louder than you can scream the lies. I've never been so hurt inside. This was the second time he exhibited that behavior. 23 out of 24 hours in this I cell. have been a police officer for almost four decades. Until the very breath was squeezed out of it. That was the very last time I seen Floyd. When you sentence my son, you will also be sentenced every day. Every day. I love George Floyd. I love him. George Floyd. 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 You guys know him best. So, who was George Floyd? I think who George Floyd is is irrelevant, but 
Outside this grocery store is now home for a memorial. We protest peacefully, kind of just helping each other out and rallying together as a community. We need to stand together with each other. We're here to serve justice for injustice. Say, say. George Floyd. <laughs> say it again. Say his name. George Floyd. Breaking news in South Minneapolis. The situation has become dangerous. Individuals breaching the gate at the third precinct. We're getting close to blocking the fence. Is anyone copying this? We oh! all here. All lives matter. You are more of your people than die. You coward. Third precinct has been compromised. They're about to breach the back gate. They're taking heavy rock. Third precinct is up in flames. Minneapolis is waking up to a lot of its buildings on fire. You saw chaos just erupt. Fires are still burning. We are seeing looting throughout the city. Bricks are being thrown at police officers. We are seeing increasing violence amongst protesters throughout the country. Cities are erupting into chaos and violence. How long can you be peaceful when your people are dying? We're out here trying to show them that we're angry. This is not just about George Floyd. It's about everything that's happened in our world. For whatever reason, it has become fashionable over the last uh, five or six years for us to turn criminals into heroes overnight. Um, and it is something that I find to be despicable and it's something that I refuse to stand by any longer and I am not going to play a part in it no matter how much pressure comes from black liberals and black conservatives as, as some token of people wanting you to believe that this is the only way you can be black is you have to say this was wrong and that this, you know, this person was amazing. I won't do that. Why are we pretending that this criminal should be upheld as a citizen, uh, a, 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 as a martyr in black America. A martyr for a fake narrative, by the way. People were shocked, right? They had all thrown themselves in emotionally based on the media the narrative. And they way. just sort of thought, how could the media not have told us this? I was the same way. So right now I am researching Alvin and Teresa Scott. They were George Floyd's last known roommates. And we basically just had producers reach out and say, we're working on documentary pertaining to George Floyd. That was kind of the only information that we gave them in the hopes that s saying my name would not scare them away. At least from what I'm doing, a cursory search, there does not seem to be too much coverage on the roommates. Um, some pieces pertaining to how they were feeling during the trial, some international coverage, but I definitely don't remember these people being at the forefront. And he lived with them for over three years, so it'll be really interesting to see what they have to say if they speak to me and don't slam the door in my face. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Hello, uh, Alvin Manego and uh, George Floyd's uh, previous roommate prior to his uh, death. Uh, this is our house, and um, give you a little walkthrough and uh, tell you a little bit about our relationship, uh, me and Floyd. So, okay. Well, we still keep his name on the mailbox, just. Still gets mail, okay. Yeah, and uh, this is us on the uh, 4th of July, uh, the 2017. And uh, these are our co-workers. We both work together at the Conga Lounge in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And that's, that's Floyd right here. And they never forgot him because he was uh, a people person. He socialized and the kids was always, you know, looking up like, wow, the guy's pretty tall. Floyd's about six, seven. So we can uh, really? head upstairs and I'll show you where Floyd's room was. <clears throat> Originally we were roommates, but when I first moved here, it was just me and uh, Floyd. And uh, Teresa later on moved in with us. And uh, this was his room, much bigger, the biggest room in the house, and he was a big guy. So uh, uh, he always enjoyed it. And uh, the difference was, was like he had a desk right here. And the only thing he always kept right there was he, either his Bible and he uh, smoked cigarettes, and you know, that was the only thing you seen on his desk. We had some good moments here. It was like, well, we lived together almost, uh, I guess it was about four and a half years, almost five years, yeah. Him and Teresa uh, often uh, read the Bible together, and yeah. that was a, 
uh, all of these is what he did. Like he got a uh, Proverbs mark right here. He used to read this all the time. Let me see, what else did he read? He read Matthews right here. And so he used to be um, in his room and we, our room was next door. And I used to hear him out loud reading his Bible all the time. And I used to be listening to him. And I'm like, wow, he really do be reading that Bible, you know? The last day I seen Floyd, we stood up here on the top of the stairs. And this time we, played, we prayed longer than we ever did. I think we prayed for like about five or eight minutes. Usually we'll do a prayer and it's like quick and everything. But this day we prayed longer than we ever prayed. And I said, I said, Floyd, I'll see you when you get back, okay? He said, T, I'll be back. I said, promise me you're coming back. He said, I promise I'll be back. And that was the last time I seen him. That was the very last time I seen Floyd that day when we uh, prayed upstairs. And I didn't see him no more after that. Hello, how are you? Hi, Hi. very nice to meet you, Alvin. Hi. Hey, Teresa, how are you? How are you doing? So you guys, in, in many ways, were some of the people that were the closest to him. Yes. And I don't remember seeing your faces on the news or anybody talking to you. So I guess let's just start with that. Um, when was the first time you met George? Oh, well, I first met him uh, in 2017. Uh, we ended up uh, knowing each other. Uh, he was in the treatment center. And uh, I actually had a... Uh, was there too, you know, but I was there for the alcohol and, you know, he was having problems with the pain pills. So when we met, we didn't was unaware that this was, uh, you know, we both was in the same situation. So you guys met um, and you figured out that you were going to the same treatment center and mm -hmm. I think, did that probably establish an instant connection with, between yeah, you two? Yeah, you know, during that time, you know, you talk about a lot of things that led you to where you were and you get an idea of who the persons that are around you, you know, more one-on-one. -on -one. And he was, uh, real open about, you know, things he was going through and what, what he wanted to be. And his old dream was to uh, get his life together, you know, and uh, have a good job and uh, be able to take care of his daughter as well as his family. He wants a fresh start and, and mm -hmm. he wanted to do better. And he happens to run into you and, and this, is, this is a beautiful home. The Floyd that I knew in this house was a good person. And if he did do something bad, he hid it from us. You know, he didn't do it around us. If he did it out there, he did it out there. That's his business. It's not mine. Addiction is hard. Yes. It's full stop hard. Right. And, but, you know, family is different. It's, it's a different part of them. And, and so the struggles that they're maybe facing out on the street is just not something that they ever want to bring to their, their doormat, you know? And that, that was Floyd. I mean, if he did have addiction out there, he left it in the streets. He never brought it home. You know, sometimes a little urge to, uh, get something stronger to kill the pain, you know, took over and I, but he, he always fought against that. He, he was talking to me, he said, T, he said, uh, he said, I do whatever the police tells mm -hmm. me to yes, do. Yeah. He said, because they looking to kill a big brother like me. Yeah. They, yeah. He said that That's, out of his own words, he said, because a big, he said, a big knee, a big ear like me, he said, they licking to kill a big brother like me. And sure enough, that's what happened. It was kind of like, like, scary when like that happened. Weeks I remember stuff later, that was one of his it fears. Happened. Yep, that was one of his fears. That's interesting, though, because what you're saying is that, so that night he just he did whatever he was supposed to, you know, whatever they told him to do, because he knew yeah. he, he that, know that they was intimidated by really him bad. because mm -hmm. he was so big. And I'm sure right. that officer probably know who he is that ran his life. You know, they got yeah. it in the computer. But, but what about, do you think that if he, had complied, because I'm sure you guys have seen the full tape by now, right? Mm -hmm. And it just, you must be thinking, woulda, coulda, shoulda, if he had had that mentality going into it, let me just do what they're saying, and, you know, because it, it's just such an escalation when you see the full tape of, you know, yeah, he's not, and maybe, because it was, he's not feeling too good, but yeah, and then he's like, put me on the, you know, put me on the ground, when he says, put me on the ground, and. You ever look at it and go, man, I wish that time he had taken, just taken his own advice and just been like, okay, guys, take me wherever you want to take me. Yes, yes, yes. Do you think that a, a lot of people maybe came out of the woodwork because there was an opportunity, you know, to 
grandstand, to be on stage, to, you know, a lot of money got thrown around, which, I, which is part of what I'm exploring in this documentary. I mean, Black Lives Matter Global Network came out and said, we raised 90 million plus dollars. And they did this with his face. Just his face or saying you had some association with him mm -hmm. could have gotten, you know, garnered a lot of people money. Do you think that people took advantage of him? Yeah, it's, of it's like they, they, uh, they use it as uh, what you say, a way of funding whatever they motivation was. And then like, I, at sometimes when I went to the George Floyd Memorial, it was different individuals going around there saying Don donations for this, for Floyd, for this. And yeah. you, you didn't yes. know where they was coming from. You, you got a little metal box <laughs> and I don't know who you are. Where is this going? to meet with the president and the vice president and for them to show their concern to our family and uh, for them to actually give an ear to our concerns and how we feel on the situation. I know I have to be strong because that's what he would want me to do. I ain't never met a sister. Mm. I ain't never met a brother. Mm. None of them ever came here to employ been living in this house. We've been in this house going on six years, am I right? Yeah. But for never, the, four, never, never, the never. four years, no. Uh, he just... They never wanted his stuff. I mean, I would think that if, if my son, They didn't son, even come and look daughter, and see where the man lived at. They never came to see... That's crazy. ...where Floyd lived. That's they never crazy. came and get none of his stuff. Nothing. That was my oldest brother. I love him. I'm never going to get my brother back. I would like to that's just like crazy. say one day, uh, this meet his daughter that's because it's like, that's an extension of him. That's crazy that none of them came to get none of his stuff, to pay their respects to, that's wild. That's wild. That makes me question like the authenticity. I mean, I, I clearly they were hurt by George Floyd being taken, but you know, it's an opportunity to, mm -hmm. to, to cry victim and get all the attention on to the nonsense, the narrative. That's crazy. That's crazy, bro. Like none of the family members came to the crib to get any of his stuff. Any of, that's wild. To just like say one day, uh, this me, this dog. I'm only hearing one side of the story, man. But that's crazy. That's crazy. Just coming out his roommate's mouth where he lived. That's crazy. My brother back. Like I would like yeah. to just like say one day, uh, this me, this daughter, because it's like yes. that's an extension of him. Mm -hmm. Right. And I just to be proud to just see one well, time. Well, not his daughter. Now we he we found out he got more. Well, they found out that that wasn't true. So you mean three kids came that ain't his? Just one. I think they did a DNA check and the the boy's not his and the other. Are you serious? It's rumors. I don't know. That's, that's we gotta leave that to Maury. I don't do that. I don't do paternity. <laughs> <Is that him? laughs> that's, that's Maury's kids. That's not what we do here. <laughs> That was a good one. That was a good one. You guys, thank you so much. It was what, what a pleasure to sit here and talk to you guys. It was just absolutely amazing. You imagine how absolutely traumatized that child was. And then you think to yourself, just a few years later, and um, you will have children that are wearing his shirt, referring to him as a hero, as some, as some sort of savior, right? That's wrong. <laughs> it's not right at all. And it was this case that I couldn't stay quiet on, and I had to make that video. In 1998, he spent 10 months in prison for theft with a firearm. In 2002, he spent eight months in prison for a cocaine offense. In 2004, just two years later, he spent another 10 months in prison for a cocaine offense. By the way, I am not saying that if you have a record, you don't deserve a second chance. I do draw the line when it comes to second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth, ch and ninth chances. Two things can be true at once. <laughs> you can both say that George Floyd didn't deserve to die, 
no matter how you believe he died, nobody deserves to die, in my opinion. And you can also say that objectively, this person that did die was not a saint. This person was not an angel. Okay, so my producer just sent me a link and a minute mark for George Floyd's 2019 arrest, which I haven't seen. So I'm about to watch it for the first time. Okay, now Floyd coming out. Okay, this is super interesting because he said the same thing. He's saying mama again, and obviously, I know that throughout the trial, his girlfriend uh, testified that he calls her mama, and the media made such a big deal saying that when he died, he cried out for his mama, and they clearly misinterpreted that because. This is a 2019 arrest. He's once again saying, I want mama. So that seems pretty clear that he's talking about his girlfriend and he's not crying out for his mother, which was a nice victim narrative. You and Floyd, Mr. Floyd, excuse me, I'm assuming like most couples had pet names for each other. Yeah. And what were you saved in his phone as? Mama. mama. What's crazy in the retrospect is to realize that everybody reacted. Nobody knew who George Floyd was, but also nobody knew who Derek Chauvin was. Literally nothing. Like. I mean, my heart breaks for her, obviously, like hearing, like she's obviously just devastated, but she's being told by his lawyer to say absolutely nothing. So she's not gonna come on camera. She's not gonna participate. He's not gonna come on camera or participate because they have a pending appeal. And my frustration and what I expressed to her is I'm just like, so your strategy for the appeal is the same thing that your strategy was during the entire trial, silence. Allow the media to tell the story. I, per I said to her, I literally said, I said, this might be the only opportunity that you guys have, right? You've already lost in the court of public opinion. So how is it going to hurt you? He's lost, right? How is it going to hurt you to allow his voice to be heard and to tell the story from his side? Nothing, like the lawyer's running the show and, I'm, and to be honest, I think it's the worst strategy. There's, there's just no way he's gonna win in the court of public opinion by saying nothing, you know? Like, super frustrating, but that's a dead end, so. I can't imagine raising up a child and loving a child and knowing who he is and watching the media in virtually minutes be able to strip that person of their identity and to create a new identity for them. I felt her pain. I did. I just, I felt her pain. And I felt that the only thing we could offer to do was to expand on who Derek Chauvin actually was. People were, were taking a picture, a, not even a picture, a still from a video, and saying, Satan, this is, this is your Satan. People were taking a, a storyline that was given to them from the media and saying, here it is, George Floyd, he's your hero. That's it, that's the story, the end. It's insane. You know Derek Chauvin. I do. I was a Minneapolis police officer for 31 years. Is it the same Derek Chauvin that the media has introduced the world to? Not at all. Derek is quiet, somewhat quirky, not a big guy, very dependable, shows up to work every day. Derek is the kind of guy that you want to show up on your calls with you. He's very level-headed. Derek, when I first supervised Derek, I was a sergeant and I was running a unit for Homeland Security. Derek got assigned onto my unit and at the time he was living with his mom, which I thought was admirable that he wanted to help take care of his mom. Derek is a quiet, thoughtful, honorable, and self, selfless man. He has a big heart 
and he always has put others before his own. He was kind of a, a guy that was a little more of a loner. Um, you know, some probably would have considered him socially awkward. You described him as quirky, and, and somebody else kind of described him in that same way. What do you mean by that? Kind of quiet, introverted. Sometimes he wears his, like, his uniform pants a little high on his boots. Um, just that way. You know, Maybe not the quarterback of the football team. Not the quarterback of the football team. <laughs> okay. Did he ever have any issues with other police officers? Was there ever any, any signs that he was particularly violent or had issues with people because of their skin color? No, never. No, that is not the Derek I knew. Mm -mm. And I, I, I don't believe I what people are saying. He knew George Floyd. It, it's made up. Right. It's not true. Some shit like that. When you sentence my son, you will also be sentencing me. Plus the fact that when he is released, his father and I most likely will not be here. Where is Derek today? Derek is at Oak Park Heights Prison. He sits in a cell for 23 out of 24 hours a day. He does not have any uh, reading materials, no TV, no computer, no nothing. He just sits in a cell. And, and that's it. You sit and look at the four walls in your cell every single day. What was your initial reaction when you saw that video in terms of looking up and seeing, hey, that's, that's Derek Chauvin, I know that guy. He's somebody that would be hard to read for most people, but, but a nice guy. So when you looked up at his face, you didn't see a monster. You just saw Derek looking as Derek has always looked and the media perhaps reading into it. They, they read into something that was not there. That is not the Derek that I knew. All of our department was painted with that same brush, which is unfair, and it's, it's a lot of false narratives because we have a good department. And we heard earlier that he is spending 23 hours a day in solitary confinement. Because he's a cop, right? Do you ever think about his mental state? Every day. But I'm not gonna sit here and like every you know, day. Act like you don't wish that on anybody. Do nothing wrong. Like he definitely got down, took George Floyd's life. So like the little pity party, they can miss me with that shit. But um, yeah, they can miss me with this. Like it is what it is. He he fucking has to pay the consequences for his actions. But um, yeah, the narrative is definitely fucked. Um, there's an incredible amount of stress in the job alone, more or less. If somebody dies in your custody, that's about the worst thing that you can go through as a person and a police officer. George Floyd was a semi-regular customer. Um, he'd come around uh, not so often, but he was someone we'd, we'd recognize. And he'd come here maybe to pay his phone bill or get phone services. So anytime a customer brings a counterfeit bill, and you see we have plenty of them. We tell them, hey, this is counterfeit. If the customer insists, then we call the police, and then the police has to ask them where they got it from. And that really hasn't ever happened. And my experience here, whenever we tell a customer that the bill is counterfeit, they immediately um, leave because they don't want to be involved with it. How can you tell us? Just from our experience, yeah, there's, there's some good ones, but a lot of times we know right away that they're fake just because of the way they have the color disfiguration, or the way they feel, the way they look. So usually we don't call the police on counterfeit money because when we tell the customer that it's fake, they accept the fact and just leave. When he came in the store, um, he was with a friend of his. Uh, the friend of his was uh, paying for some electronics repair and all of the money he had was counterfeit. Uh, because we knew the person, we told him, hey, we're not gonna call the police, just take this money back and, and don't bring it back here again. And then a few minutes later, George Floyd made a purchase in the tobacco shop with a counterfeit bill, and the employee then called the police. They arrived about 45 minutes later and found George Floyd in his car, and that's when they approached him. Hey, man. Stay in the I'm car. Sorry. Let me I'm see sorry. your other hand. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let Dr. Me see Ron other... Martinelli, forensic criminologist and certified medical investigator and police practices expert. 
let me just preface uh, this. You know, I have no dog in the fight here, all right? We classically get a lot of officer-involved shootings and in-custody deaths, but we, we take them from all sides. So my, my advocacy is for facts and evidence, not for people or entities. So if the officers are doing what they're supposed to be doing as they were trained to do it, I'm going to tell you. If they're not, I'm also going to tell you that. What was your assessment of the police behavior in seeing the full video and seeing how things played out? They make contact with Mr. Floyd, and that is totally appropriate because they're investigating a third person's report of criminality. Not moving. Put your hands behind your back then. I'm not going to do nothing. Stop resisting, man. Stand up. Please, please, man. Stand up. Why are you doing me like this? Stand up. Come on. We're trying to get out of the street here so you don't get hit by a car. So for the officers, what they have to do is they have to begin an investigation to ask him probative questions, seeking more evidence to determine whether a crime has occurred. All right, what's your name? George. We're here because it sounds like you gave a fake bill to the individuals in there. Yeah. So once they put the handcuffs on Mr. Floyd, Mr. Floyd should have known, albeit he's under the influence of drugs, Ouchie, what are, you, are you on something right now? Uh, no, nothing. Because you act yeah. real erratic. That he must obey the officer's directions, orders, and commands. He cannot resist arrest. I, I hear you, but you are going to face this door right now. Listen up. Stop. I'll do anything. Please, man. Please don't do this. Take a seat. I'm going in, Mr. I'm going No, in. you're not. And so when Mr. Floyd gets in a car and, and he claims that he's claustrophobic. Right. Claustrophobic is exactly what he said. I think if I was an officer, I'd be saying, wait a minute, you showed up in a car. You wouldn't get in a car if you thought you were claustrophobic. The officers placed him in a position that's referred to as the maximum restraint position. In other words, he's prone, stomach down, on the ground. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, good morning. We plan to prove to you, beyond a reasonable doubt, that Mr. Chauvin was anything other than innocent on May 25th of 2020. Mr. Derek Chauvin used excessive and unreasonable force upon the body of Mr. George Floyd until the very breath, no ladies and gentlemen, until the very life were squeezed out of him. Chief, that from the perspective of Miss Frazier's camera, it appears that Officer Chauvin's knee is on the neck of Mr. Floyd. Yes. Would you agree that from the perspective of Officer King's body camera, it appears that Officer Chauvin's knee was more on Mr. Floyd's shoulder blade? Um, yes. They had to have the jury believe that it was a neck restraint, it was the knee on the neck, it was asphyxiation that killed George Floyd. However, there was a ton of evidence that George Floyd consumed a toxic, lethal cocktail of fentanyl and methamphetamine. Uh -huh. uh, I hate to did it appear that Mr. Floyd said, I ate too many drugs? Yes, it did. Let's put it in perspective. Three grains of fentanyl on the head of a lead pencil, enough to kill you, enough to kill me. And so they had to continuously inculcate the public to believe that Derek Chauvin intentionally, premeditatedly murdered George Floyd and drugs had absolutely nothing to do with it, as, as Lindsay and the toxicologists presented that awful testimony. Do you recall describing the level of fentanyl as a fatal level of fentanyl? I recall describing it in other circumstances. It would be a fatal level, yes, in other circumstances. Had Mr. Floyd been home alone in his locked residence with no evidence of trauma, and the only autopsy finding was that fentanyl level, then yes, I would certify his death as due to fentanyl toxicity. What? I don't understand that. I know 
can't breathe. I 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 can't breathe. Here, come on out. The autopsy is generally broken down by number one, how the body is presented and uh, you know what his height and weight is and then it goes through the neurological system uh, exterior trauma interior trauma but i go right to the cardiovascular system and there i look at the heart weight how much does the heart weigh and then i take a look for key words i compare the heart weight to the height and weight of the individual to what the toxicology report says and I look for certain words or evidence of something called cardiomegaly. Cardiomegaly means an enlarged heart. And if a person has cardiomegaly, their chances of sudden cardiac arrest rise by 150 times, not 150%, 150 times. That is significant. And then we have the whole issue of the police encounter and the basal metabolic rate rising. Think about him being agitated, chaotic, excited, and his heart is pumping, pumping, pumping. There is zero empirical forensic evidence, medical evidence of any biological mechanism, physiological mechanism that would have interfered with George Floyd's ability to get sufficient oxygenated blood up into the brain. There, there's zero evidence of that. There was a, another passenger in the vehicle, and that passenger was Mr. Floyd's drug dealer. However, he did not end up uh, providing helpful testimony because of his own criminal liability. OK, and why would you not answer those? I'm fearful of criminal charges going forward. I have open charges that's not settled yet of my personal stuff. So basically you are invoking your Fifth Amendment right against compelled self-incrimination? Yes, sir. There was some evidence that came out of chewed up pills that were found on the floor of the police car. It's very unclear to me why that evidence was not uh, obtained earlier and presented to the jury. But I think if the jury had seen the entire picture, not only of Mr. Floyd's drug dependency, his multiple prior brushes with law enforcement, but his physical characteristics at the time of the incident and his ultimate death. Absent the interaction with the police, he could easily have died with the amount of drugs in his system with no knee on his neck or on his shoulder. And so to me, that would have suggested, if I were on that jury, reasonable doubt. But our system is such that a jury gets to decide that. Now, there were other factors, I think, that polluted the jury's ultimate ruling. You know, ultimately, the jury reached its conclusion. I'm praying the verdict is the right verdict, which is, I think it's overwhelming in my view. We've got to get more confrontational, make sure that they, th they know that we mean business. I want to see the charge of the arresting officer take place. We are not talking. I don't know how I feel about all this because it's all new information to me. But I mean, considering what they're fucking saying here, it definitely had fentanyl, methamphetamine in this system that would agitate the situation that much worse with the cops involved. You know, make shit a whole lot worse. Just like, sounds like it's just bad timing. You know what I mean? Like, the knee on the neck instigated everything because he had drugs in the system. Like, you don't really know what is the result of his death entirely. Could be knee on the neck, could be because of the drugs, could be, could be a combination of both. I'm not really sure. You know what I mean? But I know of the. Yeah, I'm not really sure, because if the knee wasn't on the neck, could he, could he have still died? Based on what the fuck they're saying, that's true. But it definitely makes me question, uh, shit, really everything. You know what I'm saying? But regardless of what's taking place here, it doesn't uh, negate the fact that, you know, the narrative was still spun the way it was, which caused, which has caused all this bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Because even if the knee wasn't on the neck, uh, there's a lot to digest here. <clears throat> In 
about a split second decision that was made incorrectly. I can't see coming to a different it sounds, answer. It sounds like the, the, the courts just fumbled the bag as far as all the evidence necessary. It just sounds like the courts fumbled the bag as far as like all the evidence they should have reviewed to, but to, to come to a decision on this case, man. That's crazy. But no, it's not crazy. Like I, I know what it is, man. You know what I'm saying? It's fucking, you know, rubbing that racist monster, man. They weren't gonna let this shit go. It's a fucking prime opportunity to exploit this, exploit the black struggle. You know what I'm saying? The black struggle. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, it doesn't it doesn't surprise me, but it's definitely eye opening seeing everything that actually took place. Of the arresting officer take place. We are not talking about a split second decision that was made incorrectly. I can't see coming to a different answer there. Thank you. Real quickly, have you seen the body camera footage yourself? No, I have not yet. The verdict <laughs> is in, in the case that has riveted the nation, the trial of Derek Chauvin. The former Minneapolis police officer was found guilty today of killing George Floyd last May. I just want to thank the prosecutors. The, the, I just want to thank God, the DNA, everybody. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I hope every killer cop is watching and paying attention because today the Black Lives Matter movement served notice on you. I'm gonna pause it here, man. Finish this shit up. It's just definitely different going through these things with the sets of eyes that I have now, man. Because I was just like everybody else. I was just like the black people you see in this film. You know what I'm saying? So emotionally vested into what the fuck's going on. I was living in the fucking matrix, man. Just the blind leading the blind. And it sucks because you can just see the puppeteers just using black folks as puppets, just exploiting that black struggle, using it against them to get us where we are right now. Not even get us where we are right now, to further this artificial racial monster that exists here in fucking America, man. But we're, we're going to finish it up, split this shit up in two parts, man. Um, Yeah, dope-ass documentary, man. Definitely eye-opening so far.